Hi to everyone. My name is Allison. Um, I'm with the Center for Election Science. I am their, one of their um, national advocacy coordinators. Um, I've done a lot of work with some of you all in the chapter program, and um, I've been in contact with Nate, and as a lot of you all may have seen, he's run a pretty successful letter to the editor campaign, and um, it's like one of the tools that hopefully everyone can utilize if you're stuck, if you'd like to get unstuck in your campaigns, or just like a really good thing to have in your toolbox if you want to do like legislative days of action, or get the um, attention of a lawmaker or even a journalist in particular. Um, I think these are just like really good things to have. So um, Nate, would you mind taking it away? Yeah, so um, hey everyone and thanks for coming today. Um, as Allison said, I'm Nate and I run Utah Proves. Uh, that's our effort in Utah just to get approval uh, voting passed across the state. Um, so today we're just gonna talk a little bit about letter to the editors or LTEs. Um, so this past year in Utah, we were able to get several letter to the editors published across various papers um, within the state. And after today, we're hoping we can pass uh, what helped us be successful to uh, other campaigns and also help share some of the feedback we received um, to help you guys be even more successful than we've been. Um, so just to start off at a couple questions for everyone. So first, can someone tell me what a letter, uh, letter to the editor is and what your knowledge of them is? It's a submission to the editorial page on the newspaper. All right. Yeah, so uh, an LTE is where readers of the paper, and I'll note usually you'll have to indicate that you live within the target audience or at very least the state um, to submit. And then you can submit a short piece around 200 to 500 words on a specific topic to be published in the next paper. Um, so then my next question is, why are these important um, for the efforts like the ones that we're trying to run? It draws attention to, to issues, but I also have found, because I've written a lot of letters to the editor, that my elected officials read them. And it's one of the ways to give them a sense of what their constituency, what's important to their constituencies. Yeah, that is exactly right. So um, LTEs can be important for many reasons. Um, and those reasons can depend on what type of effort you're running. So for instance, if you're running a ballot initiative, LTEs are very essential to get out the information about your effort, about the measure itself, and also just um, to expose the idea to active voters, um, especially since active voters are usually the ones reading the paper. Um, and yeah. then if you're running... Oh, sorry. Oh, sorry. Is there uh, is there legitimacy things? Or I don't know how hard it is to get a letter to the editor to submit, or, you know, published. Is there part of it, part of it's that, is that it seems more official than a blog post or? Yeah, so I'll go over um, some of the things that will help the, the chances of getting that published. Um, but letter to the editors are usually just able to be submitted by anybody. Um, Op-eds usually require you to indicate some type of like expertise on the topic you're discussing. So that's where, um, you know, someone who's a little bit more of an expert would write in. But an LTE is just for anybody to submit. Um, so then the next uh, instance I wanted to talk about was like if you're running an initiative like we are here in Utah where the path of um, getting the legislation passed is only going to go through the legislative body rather than through the voters. Um, and in that case, LTEs become an essential way to get the attention of key legislators or council members, um, whether that's to show them that support exists out in the public or just to create a public call to action for them so that they know um, you know, their constituents have read that as well, and then they're more inclined to listen to it. Um, so first, I want to talk a little bit about the role of LTEs in this circumstance, and then I'll get a little bit more onto if it's a ballot initiative later. Um, so you might be thinking, uh, will the letters, uh, will the legislators even see the letter to the editors? Do they care? Um, and the answer is, as Nancy said, they do read them and they really do care. Um, but there are some important things to include to increase your chances of uh, them seeing it and them responding um, in any kind of way. So the first uh, important thing is to mention your target by name. Uh, and we'll go into how to choose your target a little bit later. Um, 
So for instance, um, your state representatives or uh, state senators, they're gonna have somebody or a team of people on their staff whose job it is to find any mention of them in the media. So they do this to stay out in front of news stories that they could be questioned about to be able to address something they know constituents um, just read about and also as a way to just to know where the public stands on key issues that they deal with. Um, so you want to include this somewhere near the end of your LTE, uh, which includes the next part that I'm going to focus on, which is the call to action. And I'm going to give an example of combining these here in a second. So the uh, call to action is basically what you're asking your audience or your target to do. So um, after you've discussed the legislation and the LTE, your effort, maybe some benefits of it, uh, in the same sentence that you mention your target, you also want to ask them to consider this legislation, to vote yes on it, or whatever you decide the most effective call to action will be. Um, so I'm going to paste in here a paragraph from one of our literature, letter to the editors. And you can just kind of see how we went about this. So this is one of the ones that I wrote. And you can just see here at the end, uh, I strongly urge my representative, uh, Paul Ray and the rest of the legislature to give Utahns a chance to see how other methods work and then only choose the best one. Um, so what we were asking, we uh, narrowed in on what our target was. So that was Representative Paul Ray um, and then the rest of the legislature if they um, are reading. And then we give them the call to action, which is asking them to consider the options. So for our circumstance, we're trying to get them to uh, consider approval voting to add on to uh, an existing pilot program for ranked choice voting in the state. Okay, so I'm just going to stop there for a second. Does anyone have any questions so far or anything like that? I saw a hand up earlier. I am. Um... Uh, what I was going to suggest was, was covered, um, naming the representative by name. Uh, John, did you have something? Well, yeah, I, I, I assume you put the letter in the chat not, and you're not screen sharing. Are we seeing the whole letter or just the, the ending? That's right. So this is just the ending. Um, I will paste a few links of various ones that we got published for you guys to see the whole letters uh, later. But this is just the ending for one of them. All right, so um, let's move on to the next part. And okay, so then um, this is a uh, focus so far on if your target was like a legislator or a council member or something like that, mentioning them specifically by name. But what if your target is a constituency? What if it's the voters rather than elected officials? Um, then you want to change that um, mention to a little bit more broad. So you want to say something like, uh, I strongly urge my fellow voters to, to consider um, voting yes on this ballot initiative or something like that. Um, so let's talk a little bit about the uh, principles of a letter to the editor and what the process of actually writing one is like. And then if we have time, um, I just want to go through and have everyone kind of um, go through the beginning process of getting this started. And we'll just try to get a few examples. So um, the first thing that we want to do is we want to figure out where we're going to submit the letter to the editor. So this is pretty much as simple as a Google search. Um, you probably already have a good idea of which uh, big papers and publications are in your state and which ones are important. So usually it's as simple as um, looking up something like uh, the name of the publication and then submit LTE. So I'm just going to for instance, we have Deseret News here in Utah. So you would just look up something like this, Deseret News from LTE. And for me, the first result is actually the submission link, um, which is really helpful. Um, you can do this for most publications. Um, now, another thing to consider too is to look for papers and publications that you may not have heard of that are still within your state. Um, so ones that may not pull up initially when you look up, um, you know, publications or papers in your state or like university papers or um, ones for specific cities, things like that. Um, so you just want to spend, you know, maybe five, 10 minutes just looking up um, all of the possible papers that you could submit to, just getting an idea of where you can submit. Um, and then, so what I want you guys to do right now, we're just going to take um, about three minutes. And I just want everyone to go online and just try to find 
a few places where you can submit LTEs and then just make a list with the names and the links so that you can have this when you're ready to submit an LTE. Um, it's just a useful resource to have. So we'll just take a few minutes and then come back. Um, yeah, so go ahead. And I'll keep the, um, the time, Nate. And just a reminder, that's just to identify some newspapers for you all. And that's like three or so minutes. How big of a factor should the size of a newspaper be in um, whether or not we choose to submit an LTE there? For instance, the biggest paper in Colorado is the Denver Post. Would it maybe make sense to aim somewhat lower or anything like that? Or? So um, I think one of the best strategies is to aim for all levels if you can. Um, so the big ones are obviously key because you're reaching the biggest constituencies. Um, but if you're doing something like a university paper, then that gives you the ability to kind of uh, tailor your language to them specifically, um, try to let them know what the benefits are for them and give them a specific call to action. Um, so there can be benefits for uh, any size of paper that you're submitting to, but I would definitely encourage people to submit to uh, all the papers that you can. Also, what do you think of copying and pasting an LTE that I've written and submitting it to say half a dozen different papers? Um, so while I don't think it's necessarily a problem to submit the same LTE to other papers, papers do want to make sure that they're the only one publishing um, the LTE. So I would just be, um, just be diligent to make sure that if one paper ends up publishing the LTE to let the other ones know, hey, they published it. Now that can be a little bit different if you're submitting to a bunch of local papers. So um, in Utah, one of my LTEs actually got published um, and like they got published in like a Southern Utah local newspaper and then it also got published in the Salt Lake Tribune. Um, and I don't think that they were too concerned because it didn't overlap with the people who were reading it. Um, but that is something to consider. Just try to get one LTE published in one place. I am in a community of about 80,000 here in Northwest Arkansas. It is a blue island in a red sea. And um, in our local newspaper, um, we write regularly. Um, and the editors rec recognize us. You know, when they, when they don't know us yet, they um, check our ID and they are very scrupulous about checking what we submit. And if we write like a letter per month or something, after a while they know who we are. And some of us, they rather like to get letters from. So I would say you want your letter not to be broadcast to a bunch of other papers because that's not interesting content for the editor. They don't want something that looks like they stole it from some other paper. And so, um, so I would say, don't broadcast it. At, at least tailor a version for your local paper. They'll like it and they'll receive you better in the future. Yeah, that's absolutely right. Thank you. Um, that okay. was a really good way to put that. So I uh, just wanted to say we have like 20 seconds, 30 seconds to come back with your, um, with your um, targeted submissions and I'm pretty sure Nate might ask a few of you to share. So just get yeah. ready for that. Yeah, so um, yeah, let's just go ahead and bring it back. Um, so hold off for a second on which ones you have but keep that list up and then I will have you share in just a second. Um, so now that you've picked the places that you wanna submit, the um, go ahead and choose one of those places for this next part. Just keep that in your mind as I go over this. So. Um, the next part is identifying your audience or your targets. So again, this is going to depend on what kind of effort you're running. So if you're running an effort that relies on the voters, um, this is most important when um, your target is a constituency. So if the paper is for a certain city, county, university, whatever, consider who you're writing to, what they care about, what's relevant to them right now, um, how you can appeal to them. 
And then if you're running a campaign that's focused on legislators, um, then you're identifying the targets going to depend on key committee members, um, party leadership, depending on the dynamic of your state and locality. So for example, here in Utah, um, we are mainly focusing on uh, key committee membership, but then we also had to consider focusing on party leadership for a moment because the Republican Party is so strong here that they have their caucus is usually who ultimately decides what legislation goes into the session. So we want to appeal to um, the leadership who's making that decision as well. Um, and then also that would be, you know, your state representatives and your senators and stuff like that. So if, if you don't know what your efforts can be focusing on yet, that's fine. Maybe just pick one for this exercise. Um, so now that you have your audience and who we're uh, submitting to, let's start a little bit of writing. So um, one short thing to touch on here is that while we, um, while talking about approval voting and the reform overall is a good thing, sometimes you want to narrow in on one specific benefit um, for the whole length of your LTE, especially considering that LTEs are a very short thing. You don't have much to include, so you don't wanna be naming off six benefits and then don't have time to get to any of them, right? Um, so the first sentence is often the most important. So this is what grabs their attention, uh, gets the readers to wanna keep reading and finish the LTE. Um, and oftentimes publishers will make the title of the LTE themselves just based on the content of your LTE. So you don't usually have to worry about creating a title, but in the case if your publisher um, does allow title submission, then the same considerations will go into the title as the first sentence. How do you grab their attention? How do you get them to want to read the LTE? Okay, so what we're going to do now is just take another three minutes. Um, so take some time to consider your audience and your target. And then just try to write um, one sentence that's just kind of attention grabby or maybe a few sentences if you have time. And then I'd like to hear from two of you. So um, who you wanna to submit to, who your audience is, and then just what you've written. So we'll just take another few minutes. And again, I'll keep the time. So about three minutes from now. All right, we have about one minute left.
All right. So that's time. If you can just finish writing your sentences, if you're in the middle of one. All right. So um, let's go ahead and hear from two people on um, what you've, so who you're submitting to, what your audience and, or target is, and then what you're up. I'll bite. How about your freedom to exhale without a mask ends where my freedom to inhale begins? Yeah, that, that is an excellent attention grabbing line. So he's mentioning something that's very relevant on everyone's minds right now. Um, it makes you think, what is he about to talk about next? And now you're hooked, right? So that was a great example. Thanks. Um, Nancy, I think you're on mute. Um, so uh, communities, small and large, rural and urban, are wrestling with the question of how to reform criminal justice and policing systems in New York State. The critical question in this conversation is, what would make you feel safe in this community? And um, this letter is to candidates that are running for office. So it goes on to ask what their solutions are. Perfect. Yeah, that's great. So um, again, very attention grabby, a very relevant subject right now. Um, and then that allows you to bring that subject that everyone's thinking about to the issue that you want them to focus on. So that was a great, great start. Okay. So um, so next, uh, we've talked a little bit about the topic um, of the LTE. We've talked about what the beginning should look like and what the end should look like with a call to action and the mention. Um, so what about the rest? What about the content in the body? So this is gonna depend a little bit on the general dynamic of your state. So um, for instance, some of the questions you might be asking yourself is, would it be necessary to address RCV for instance? So for us and some of our LTEs we mentioned uh, ranked choice voting simply because there was a um, competing bill that was trying to uh, make ranked choice voting standard across the state. Um, and we were trying to get legislators to consider other options before committing to that. Um, so that was something that was relevant for us to address. It might not be for your state though. Um, do you need to introduce people to the idea of alternatives first? So um, are people aware of alternative voting methods to begin with? Um, and then again, something to remember with this is to remember your audience, who you're writing to. So try to appeal to what they would be um, interested in reading about um, and what their values are. Okay, so one thing when going into content that we found um, is that people are ready for more detail than you might think. So uh, we were worried we might lose people by including too much detail um, on certain topics or um, specific benefits of approval voting. But we actually had comments on a couple of our LTEs that asked for more detail and, and um, said we didn't give them enough info on approval voting. So even though we discussed the benefits, they wanted to know what's behind those benefits. Why do those benefits work? And that was something that we thought maybe um, would be too much jargon. Um, but I think there's a line there. There's, um, I think what the goal is, is to go into the weeds just enough to spark their curiosity and to show them that you know what you're talking about and that encourages them to do the research on their own. Um, and that's super beneficial for a lot of reasons. One, people like to make decisions on their own. So if you, you know, spark that curiosity and get them researching and then they learn more about approval voting, that gets them uh, more interested in wanting to help institute approval voting. Okay, so then, um, Another thing to consider when you're writing the body is the overall tone. Um, you want to be respectful and professional to whoever you're writing about or to. Uh, the last thing you want is your legislator opposing you because you owned them in the paper. <laughs> That's not helpful for us at all, um, even though it might feel good in the moment. Um, and then furthermore, doing anything that's not professional or respectful decreases your chances of getting published. Um, these papers and publishers, they want to see a reasonable part of the conversation articulated well um, so that it can further the conversation so that people can reply to it. Um, so all of those kind of things are uh, really important to keep in mind. Now, another thing that I wanted to talk about is um, 
writing an LTE in response to another LTE or in response to an existing article. Um, this is another really good way to get people to pay attention to what you're writing about. And um, also if, if readers have read that article earlier in the week, they might realize what you're responding to. Um, so I'm gonna paste a letter by one of our members in here. I'm just gonna paste the link and you guys can pull that up. So it was on Deseret News. Um, Miles, one of our members, um, wrote this in response to a, uh, another article um, that they were calling the draft party, right? And so um, it was really uh, awesome of him to respond to that in the way he did because it brought up the draft party again, which is a very catchy headline. You don't, what are you talking about with a draft party, right? And then you read it and you understand. So he responds to that. Um, and then that gets more people who have already read the article looking um, plus all the new readers. So that's another thing to keep in mind is if, if you have something to respond to, um, do it and include that in the article because that, again, it's, that, it's about that conversation and that conversation is what the papers and publishers are after. All right, so um, now that we've gone over just kind of like the content of an LTE, the process of writing it, um, let's zoom out a little bit and take a look at how this all fits into your effort and um, how to make that plan. So, um, for us, it was super essential for us to plan an LTE effort over a period of months. Now, if you're doing like a, a day of action or something that might be a little bit different, you might want to try to get LTEs published across several papers all in one day just to make the day about what you're talking about. But if you're going for something more long term, um, you're trying to get legislation passed, you're trying to get a ballot initiative passed, doing this over months is really helpful because uh, it helps voters see this so so if you're focusing on voters it helps voters see this multiple times before they actually vote on the ballot initiative it gives them a chance to be exposed to the issue it gives them a chance to think about it and do their own research um, if you're doing a legislature-based effort this helps because it lets them know that you're not going away and that your effort is strong and consistent so you're going to be here for a while um, you're reminding them monthly or twice a month in the media that hey, people care about this issue, and we're going to be here trying to push that when the session comes around. Um, so yeah, those are some of the um, uh, things to consider when you're planning an LTE effort. So doing it over uh, a few months is really important. Now, the next thing is um, having different members submit different topics. So um, it's really helpful for uh, legislators and voters to see that multiple different people are posting about the same topic, because if they see four LTEs about approval voting within the period of two months, but it's all by the same author, these people, the legislature especially is going to think uh, it's just one person. It's not a big effort. We don't really need to worry about it too much. Um, but if you have different people posting, they're going to realize more and more that um, there's a lot of people that care enough about this to write into a paper and get it published. Um, and then the other thing, as I mentioned, is different topics. So. Um, if you are going to be narrowing your in your LTE around um, various benefits of approval voting over a period of time, maybe one time you'll submit uh, one that focuses on the spoiler effect, and then maybe you'll do one that focuses on center squeeze and um, you know et cetera. Like all of these different benefits, you want to have a topic about each one of them over time. Um, again, that helps get the voters, your um, your representatives, just more educated about the effort. And um, it's, it's good for all of us to have everyone educated. So, OK, um, so the next thing I want to do, I just want to go ahead and give you a few more examples of some of the LTEs we got published. So I'm just going to post a few links in here for you guys. So this first one um, was written by Ammon here in Utah. Um, this was one that was written to a very specific publication. Um, that he was familiar with and that very specific people read. Um, so you can look over this and see how he appeals to the readers. Um, I also really like his first line here. So he, he says, have you ever tried playing chess without taking any of, your, any of your opponent's pieces? This question is ridiculous to anyone who has the slightest notion of how chess is played. All right, so he, he appeals to a topic that most people know about and understand that this is a ridiculous idea. And then he later goes on and compares that to our current election process um, and how approval voting could make that better. Um, so uh, in, in these LTEs, you've seen a few examples of kind of how to grab attention. Um, here's another one. Let's 
So this was uh, published by um, the Salt Lake Tribune from one of our members, uh, Ben. And um, so basically the idea of this is just a- Dude, I'm sorry, I'm not of... seeing the links. Oh, are you in the chat? Yeah, let's see. In the chat. Oh, you, you might be what? incidentally DMing a person. a person. Yeah, I, am. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to say. My, yeah. my, hold on. Okay, so here's the giraffe party one. Perfect, thanks. Here's the chess one. And then here is the one from Ben. So you can just get an idea. Um, you can see that some of these are different lengths. Um, and that's another thing to consider is different publications will have different length requirements. You can see that on their publication page. It'll usually list that pretty clearly. But um, you can just see the different approaches that we've taken, um, what we've talked about, uh, you know, how we grab attention is different from every writer. Um, but you just want to think about how you can do that, how you can fit that into your writing style. OK, so um, that's pretty much all I had prepared for uh, today. Does anyone have any questions that I could go over or um, any specific asks? I have a question. On the approval yeah. voting, how do we identify targets? How do we know who to write to? Yeah, so um, that's a great question. Maybe we can just uh, go through an example. So um, for us with approval voting, our ask was pretty straightforward. Um, we found the committees that are going to be uh, dealing with these type of methods. And then we focused on the uh, committee leadership. And then we also focused on all the committee members after we had contacted committee leadership. So it's kind of just setting out like a hierarchy of who's most important to contact right now. Um, but for instance, if you are doing um, a ballot initiative and that ballot initiative is specifically for say, like if we wanted to do one for Salt Lake City, then maybe what we do is uh, post an LTE to the Salt Lake Tribune and our target would be the voters of Salt Lake. But then you wanna consider what do the voters of Salt Lake care about? What are they worried about right now? And stuff like that, which helps you narrow in, um, you know, which movements are big right now and getting a lot of attention. And maybe you can kind of tailor what you're saying to those, so stuff like that. Does that kind of answer your question? I'd like to share um, an experience um, in our city of Fayetteville, Arkansas. Um, we have a secret group of letter writers made up of uh, friends who are members of the Omni Center for Peace, Justice and Ecology here. And we want to get a progressive voice displayed in the editorial page. And we want to respond to the issues that are at play, whether it's national or local, whatever. And um, so we meet monthly and encourage each other and share tips and so on. But nobody knows that such a group exists. Nobody knows that the rapid responders letter writing group exists. And we don't refer to each other in our letters because we don't want um, to have the perception that these people are in cahoots and are trying to harp us with this message or indoctrinate us with the message. We want it to look like a lot of separate voices are independently writing an opinion that is worth considering. Um, otherwise, our group would be like one person writing all the time. And over years, our group has faded and grown in energy and enthusiasm. Sometimes it almost fades out and then it resurges and stuff. But a secret underground group can feel pretty hip and can accomplish those kind of things. So it's just an idea. Yeah, I love that. Um, I think that actually is something really important to consider because as I mentioned earlier, you don't want to make it seem like your whole campaign is coming from one person. And that's the exact same thing. If you, um, over years, if you give voters the impression that the only group fighting is your group, um, then it's going to seem like it's a smaller effort than exists, right? So um, in our letters, we never mention that we're part of Utah Proves, um, that we're, you know, talking with CES or anything like this. We just focus on what's important and why we want the legislators to do this. Um, 
And yeah, it makes it look like it's just a bunch of different citizens writing in. And that is the reality, right? We all came together because we were a bunch of citizens that cared about this issue. But we all know the perception of bias can come into play when people think it's just a, an interest group, right? So avoiding that is definitely a good thing to keep in mind. Okay, any other questions or um, asks or anything like that? Um, I have a question also. Yeah. When you're looking for um, legislators or other people to identify, what are like the best markers of someone who has like the, the best chance of moving on an issue or, you know, cause there's usually a lot of legislators. So yeah. how, how did you work through finding who to pinpoint in that process? Yeah, so, um... What we did mainly was uh, focus on, again, committee leadership. So for us, the um, government, uh, government operations and then the political subdivisions were the two committees that would deal with voting issues. Um, so we were trying to focus on those two. And then um, another thing that can be helpful, though, is uh, say you've published a couple of LTEs, maybe you're in contact with these legislators so they know kind of what you want to do. Um, maybe mention your legislator specifically, um, because later down on the line, eventually the legislative body is going to vote on it. So if you kind of have that all considered um, and you write in saying, hey, I live in your district and you are my representative and I, as a constituent, am asking you to do this, that motivates um, those legislators to listen as well. With submitting letters to the editor, how much is too much? Um, if I could somehow get um, 10 people to all submit an LTE on the same topic, would that be going overboard? Would it be bad if I was somehow able to submit an LTE every week to the same newspaper? Um, yeah. yeah, that's an excellent question. Um, so I think one thing you want to consider is how many publications you have. Um, a lot of readers will read multiple publications. Um, you know, if you have like Google feed or something, you swipe over and it just pops up relevant articles to your interest, right? So you don't want to overwhelm people with say, like I think 10 on one day would be a little bit much. Um, maybe like two on one day about the same topic would be, that already seems like a lot to be published in papers across the state on one day. Um, but if you have 10 people who are willing to write letter to the, letter to the editors, then spreading that out over a few months is a great idea because, um, like I said, it keeps up that pressure. It, it lets the legislators and the voters know that this is an issue that's um, relevant, pressing, that um, there's people that are concerned with it and it's gonna stay here. And then we have Emily's hands up. Yeah, um, I was just wondering in anyone, this is a question open to anyone on this call because I know Ellis mentioned he had a group, a progressive group he had organized um, how do we target more um, students or younger populations like high school and college kids and the immigrant communities? I also live in a deeply red district. I'm trying to flip blue and I feel like targeting these people is the way to go, but I don't know where to find them because I'm 30 and a mom. So sure. <laughs> I don't know. Yeah, and I think that's something that is really cool about uh, literature to the editors because it helps you just get it out to the population and then you can kind of choose who you're tailoring it for. Um, so one thing for like uh, university students is looking for university papers to submit to and that's always a great idea. Um, some of them may only take submissions from students themselves, um, but it's always worth looking into. Um, Otherwise, if you're posting in papers that more than just your target population is going to read, it can be important to again find what um, what they care about, what those voters are going to, um, you know, what they're going to click on if they see something in a title. So just kind of getting to know your audience a little bit, know what they care about, um, right. know what's important to them right now and, and mention those things in LTE. What if we're trying to recruit these people to our groups or our coalitions to join us in writing these letters? I mean, because we also want to stay under the radar of our congresswoman's, you know, press machine. Um, you know, I guess signing my name 
I, I guess a lot of people are really smart. They go about maybe searching for me on Facebook, but I don't know that everyone is that savvy. Um, yeah. Do you have any suggestions for reaching, looping those people into our group? Right. Yeah. So um, LTEs can be a good way to get new members interested in what you're doing. Um, and like you said, there are going to be people who will look up um, your name. They're going to look up the effort that you're doing and, um, for us, it's really easy because if you search approval voting Utah, we're the first like three results. Um, so that kind of stuff works out. But if you have someone, if you're trying to recruit people that um, maybe won't do that research, I don't, I'm tempted to say LTEs aren't the best place to do that just because they're very focused on convincing people of something you want to do. Um, so, you know, you might mention like, hey, approval voting is great and this is what we want. But if your call to action is join us, then most people are going to forget what they just read, if that makes sense. Um, so I think maybe, um, you know, coming up with some other ways to recruit and finding um, other ways to get new members might be more beneficial. And, and we're actually going to be hosting more trainings about that kind of thing exactly, because um, this is one part of a much larger piece. And it is much more effective to do actual either like relational organizing or community-based organizing to uh, recruit and attract um, people, like the kinds of people that you would like to recruit and attract. Um, and you don't really do that. You have to do that in a much more direct way, right? Like it, it's, it's not usually the best idea to rely on like a third party kind of method. Yeah, so it's, it's much better to start to reach out to certain groups and um, you build out a network. And once that network starts to build out, then it starts to reward you by giving you more and more opportunities to speak to more and more groups and, you know, have, and this is where it's good and, where we're also going to start trainings on like to have a presentation ready and um, make sure that presentation is flexible enough to address multiple groups or make sure that you can target it to certain groups. And, you know, you can, you can um, shove out things like that aren't necessarily um, LTEs, but you can use newspapers and other forms of media to say like, Hey, we're going to have like, open houses or whatever it is, um, or even like request um, conversations with folks. You can do that through like finding them on social media, DMing them, asking them if they would be interested in talking with you further. There's a bunch of different ways to do it, but LTEs are probably not the best ways to do it because a lot of these populations, particularly younger populations, are not reading letters to the editor diligently. Thank you. And um, that actually reminded me of something I wanted to touch on earlier a little bit. Um, so when we were talking about getting more voices to submit and making it appear like it's coming from many people rather than one group, another thing to consider is those um, other groups that organize in your state around certain issues. If you can create partnerships with them. Um, so for instance, we've reached out to the local Sunrise Movement and have partnered with them. Um, it's really helpful to just ask hey, can some of your members maybe submit an LTE that ties in what you care about, so climate change um, with approval voting, and that that will help people um, who are interested in climate change maybe read more about approval voting, and um, you know, you can do that with anything, any issue, any group that you have in the state. I'm curious about um, how important timing considerations are is it important to submit this close to an election, either before or after? Um, is it super helpful to submit it in response to a recent news story or another LTE, say one supporting our choice voting? Um, or is it, do I lose next to nothing by just submitting it out of the blue? Yeah, um, no, timing definitely is something to consider. Um, and so like when I say that we're planning this effort over months, when you're talking about maybe um, a specific benefit of approval voting, those kind of things maybe aren't super essential on timing and those can be planned out over a few months during, you know, the off season or whatever um, of your legislative body. But 
Um, if, if you have, uh, you know, one, like the legislative session is coming up, it's about to start and you know that these committee me members are about to look at your legislation, focusing like a week long campaign on trying to get four published, all pressuring that same legislative like committee to, to focus on your issue. That is something that's super helpful. Um, so just considering, uh, what your goals are and what's coming up, um, can help you know what timing to apply with what you're submitting. What's your su approximate success rate for getting LTEs published? Yeah, um, that would be a good question. I don't know entirely how many we published across the entire group, but I would say that we're over 50% on our publish rate for, from what we've submitted um, already. So that's been super promising. Um, and I think, I think it's just, it's really helpful. I think that first sentence of like bringing something relevant in is really helpful for getting published because um, when the legislative session started, one of the first LTEs that I got published was talking about how the whole legislative body is gonna be focusing on like four different pieces of legislation on voting methods. So it was super relevant. People were like, oh yeah, I've heard something about this. And then, you know, we focused on approval voting after that. So um, that was really helpful for us, I think. And Ellis has his hand up. I wanted to mention to Frank that um, one of the factors in the timing is that the editor is your friend in choosing the timing and will do it in a helpful way usually. If an issue is hot and has a short shelf life, he might um, get it on the page right away. Or if it has expired already, he might throw it in the trash or if it can wait because it has a long shelf life, he might publish something of somebody else's urgent today and save yours uh, to good effect. So you have an ally in that timing issue. So it's okay to send things in and let them choose. And um, uh, another point that occurred to me was um, we were talking about, I think you asked Frank how often to write um, some papers have explicit rules right in in the guidelines that not only tells you how many words you must not exceed in your letter which you need to know and varies among newspapers but also you might be allowed to submit one newspaper a month and no more but if they look forward to your letters they're really welcoming of it on the 31st day they want to hear from you but they have their rules so you learn what the rules are at each target paper. Yeah, and um, I just want to add on to the uh, sentiment that they're your friends. Um, I had a really good interaction with uh, one of the publishers here. So um, kind of along the thinking that we were talking about earlier, I submitted two very similar, they might have been identical LTEs to two different publishers. One of them published it, so I reached out to the other one and said, hey, just so you know, it got published in this paper. Um, but then I was able to write a new one and have them publish that one. And they were willing to work with me on that after they had already accepted the first one. So, um, they're usually pretty responsive and, uh, willing to work with you on whatever you want to do. All right. We have like just a few more minutes. So if anyone has any questions, you can ask them now comments. All right, if not, um, and you think of some, oh, were you gonna say something, Jim? Thank you. Oh, <laughs> thanks. Um, so here, actually, I see Emily asked the question, how do I get on the newsletter? What I'm gonna do is, you can email me um, and I can add you with your info. If you have any more questions or you think of something um, at a later time, you can email me at any time. I don't want to give that up for Nate without him agreeing no, to it. That's actually fine. I was actually gonna okay. say if, um, if anyone's like writing an LTE and has a question or would like some like feedback on it, feel free to send it my way. And I'm also in the Discord, uh, if you are all not in the Discord already, I'm not sure if you are. Um, let me just drop the link 
to the Discord here, just in case. Um, it's a pretty easy way to get in direct contact with folks. So here's the Discord if you haven't joined already, you can DM me there. Um, and, you know, feel free to contact us anytime. Thank you all for joining and um, look forward to doing some more trainings and workshops. And if you, if some of you are in chapters and would like to lead workshops because you feel like you have a specific area of expertise, I would love for you to reach out and we can work something out also. Um, but if that's it, have a great night and uh, look forward to seeing you all soon.